Hello. In this companion video, we are going to continue our demonstration series around multi-site orchestrator. And in this particular instance, we are going to show both control plane and data plane in action. So really quickly, I'm going to show you a couple of different examples. I'll start out by establishing connectivity using a stretched EPG and a bridge domain lives across both sites. Then once I establish that, I'm going to show you a security feature called intra-EPG isolation, which allows me to tightly control communications inside an EPG. My next example, I will show you connectivity across site-specific EPGs and bridge domains. And this is where I will apply contracts across sites and show you and talk about the existence of shadow objects. I'll also show you what it looks like from the point of view of the spines, because if you remember in the multi-site environment, the spines have an extra job to translate all of the values between the site specific to make it all make sense. And then in my next example, I'll actually show you that it is quite possible to do things like live migration, uh, moving VMs that live in one site to another site without losing connectivity in the process. And then finally, I'll end up by showing you two additional security features. Uh, through the point of view of MSO, the first one called Preferred Groups, and the second one called VZNE. Don't worry if you don't know what those terms mean. I'll make that clear when I show you the example. And just like always, I just want to remind everybody of the topology that I'm using in my particular lab. Site 1, Amsterdam on the left. Site 2, Barcelona on the right. My intersite network is up and running, and my MSO cluster is fully deployed. So in the first example, I'm going to show you the connectivity of a stretch EPG. So what does that look like in multi-site orchestrator? If you remember from the video before, we had created a tenant called Brown and we stretched a VRF across both of our sites. Additionally, in that video, we created a bridge domain called stretch and then we created an EPG attached to that bridge domain also called stretch. In my example, I'm going to connect two endpoints, endpoint one and endpoint two, and show you how they communicate and what that looks like in a working environment. Here we are logged into our MSO. So I'm going to go into application management under my schemas. These schemas should look familiar to you because we created them in the video before. I'm only going to be working exclusively with the brownfield tenant or tenant brown. So I'm going to go ahead and click into that schema. Now all of this stuff I created in the video before so it should be familiar to you. But there's a couple of additional things that I need to do that I did not show in the video before. Namely mapping VMM domains to my EPGs that will allow me to connect virtual machines and then they can talk. So what I'm going to do is in the schema brownfield, I have a template called common items. Now remember, this bridge domain and EPG live equally across both sites. So we will find that under the template called common items. And there's my EPG stretch right there. But in this particular case, in site number one, I have a VMM domain already configured sitting there waiting for me to connect virtual machines to. In site number two, I have an entirely different VMM domain that is specific and lives only in site number two doing that exact same function. So when I make the mapping of this stretch EPG, I'm going to map the site specific VMM domains to the EPG. So I can't do that at the template level. I have to do that down here at the site template level. So I'm going to click and start with Amsterdam first. So clicking on the site of Amsterdam common items, there's my EPG. And if I go to the configuration column on the right, and I scroll down, you'll see at the very bottom there's an area called domains, and I'm going to go ahead and add the domain here. So my domain is a VMM domain. It's already been pre-created. I'm just making the mapping to the EPG here. I need to see a list of all my VMM domains. In this case, in Amsterdam, I only have one, so I'll go ahead and select that. My deployment immediacy, I think the default is on demand, or you can select immediate, and the same is true for resolution immediacy. And it's just that easy, so I'll make that happen by clicking Save. The next thing I need to do is the exact same set of tasks, but the mapping of the VMM domain that is site-specific to Barcelona, or site number two. So again, here's the same EPG called Stretch. And I'm going to do the same kind of mapping, so I'll go a little quicker this time. VMM domain. Notice it's a different name because it is a different VMM domain. This lives only in Site 2. The first one only lived in Site 1. So I'll go ahead and use the same uh, settings and click Save. Now you'll notice at this point I've changed policy, but just like always, I haven't actually deployed it by the presence of these little yellow uh, triangles that are saying, hey, you, you haven't pushed it yet. I'm going to need to push that to my sites. So we do that at the template level 
So clicking on common items, if we click on deploy to sites, we will see here that we will be mapping VC underscore DVS to Amsterdam and VC underscore site two to Barcelona. Okay, what I'm not going to show you is changing the VM port group membership. Assume that's already done by your VMware admin. Okay, template and schema are deployed. VMs have been put in their appropriate port groups in their respective VMM domains. Now let's take a look at what things look like from inside the APEX managing each of the sites. So here we have the APEX that's managing site number one, Amsterdam. We can see on the left that I'm in tenant brown and I am looking at the point of view of EPG stretch. And under the operational tab, I can see I've got an endpoint, stretch S1-10A. I got an IP address of 4.10. If we look at the APIC managing Barcelona site 2, exact same view under the EPG stretch operations tab, you can see I have a second endpoint, Ubuntu stretch S-30, at the IP address of 192.168.4.30. So those are my two endpoints. Now let's actually take a quick look at the COOP database in the spines that are managing site 1 and site 2 and see what we see. So clicking into the fabric tab in site number one, in my spine, that's in pod one, inside the coop for VRF overlay one, and this is the what I'm interested in is the endpoint database. So this is the coop database of the spines that are in site one. And we can actually see that we have two entries that we care about for this example. We can see we have 4.10 right there, IP and Mac have been learned, and we have 4.30, which actually lives in the different site, but we see it show up in the coop database because communications have been established because they're both members of the same stretched EPG. Now what I want to do is actually show you another way to check the Coop uh, database using the CLI, but I'll do this from the perspective of the spine in site two. You can see here that I've issued the command called show Coop internal info ip-db and I grabbed that particular subnet of 192.168. something. And you can see here, this is a really short summary of me looking at the Coop database in the spines in site two. And you can see once again, I have the two entries that I care about equally exist in the spines in site two. And that is exactly what you should see if everything's working in the case of a stretched EPG. Now, just to prove that everything's working, here I am, I'm on the console of the endpoint that lives in site number one, and you can see its address here is 192.168.4.10. And if I click over into the console of the endpoint that's living in Barcelona site two, you can see this guy's address is 192.168.4.30. So I should be able to send traffic by pinging across from one endpoint to the other. And as you can see, pings are flowing just fine. Okay, now let's make a minor change. I'm still gonna be working with the EPG stretch, but I'm going to enable a security feature called intra EPG isolation. Just a quick point of review, we know that the default behavior of standard ACI is if you belong to the same EPG, you're allowed to communicate without any need for any kind of contracts or filters. But in this particular case, by enabling the feature called intra-EPG isolation, I change that behavior. And by turning it on, I'm effectively telling ACI, even though you belong to the same EPG, nobody can talk. It's a little bit like the concept of PVLAN. So where do I enable this wonderful feature? Well, back in MSO, in my brownfield schema, I'm under the template called common items because I want this to apply equally to both sites. And this is going to be the same setting in both sites, so I do it at this level. So clicking on common items, if I click into EPG stretch, and if I look at the control column on the right, you can see at the very bottom, there's a feature here called intra EPG isolation. Now I've got my ping still running from my stretched uh, EPs, but I'm gonna go ahead and click enforced. It gives you a warning because in certain cases, this could have a, an impact that you didn't expect. But in my case, I'm fine. I don't worry about this at all. So I'll click yes. And just like always, I'll deploy to sites. And here we're going to basically turn into EPG isolation from unenforced to enforced for both of my sites. Now, before I do that, let's just verify that my ping is still going. I'll click deploy, come back and check that my ping actually should stop. So here's my two endpoints in my EPG stretch. Pings are going just fine from 4.30 to 4.10. Let's go ahead and enable intra EPG isolation and see if the pings stop. Okay, so back in MSO, clicking deploy.
and checking back in my endpoints, you can see it looks like the pings have stopped. That's exactly what we want. That's exactly what intra EPG isolation does. My next example, I'll show you connectivity across site specific EPGs. In this case, I'm going to be working with EP3 and EP4. And I will show you by the deployment of a contract between those EPGs, it will allow communication to happen. And I'll show you what that looks like in multi-site from a control plane and a Coop database point of view. I have already set up a mapping in my site Amsterdam from my EPG called AMS Clients. I've already done the VMM mapping. It's exactly the same as the example before. And I've done the same thing in Barcelona to an EPG called BCN Servers. And there's my mapping to the VMM domain that lives in site two. Taking a look over at APIC, this is the APIC managing site number one. We can see here I'm in the tenant brown and I can see my application profile called AMS-Clients. And I can see my endpoint here at the IP address of 192.168.1.10. Notice I only see the EPGs that are specific to Amsterdam at this point in time. Once we apply the contract, we're gonna see that view change and I'll point that out when the time comes. If we click over into the APIC Managing Barcelona in site number two, again, we can see under Tenant Brown, we have a different EPG called BCN-Servers. And looking at the operational view, we can see we have an endpoint at the IP address of 192.168.3.100. So just to recap, we have two different networks. Network number one lives in site number one. Network number two lives only in site two. But what we want to do is establish communication between them. And in order to do that, we're going to need a contract. Before I go into the details of applying a contract, I wanted to show you what the Coop database looks like in this particular example, because what we'll find might surprise us. Okay, so let's compare the Coop databases side by side. So this is the Coop database view of the spine that's in site number one. And we can see here, there's my endpoint of 1.10. Where's 3.100? It doesn't show up yet. If we take a quick view of the Coop database in the spine in site number two, we can see here, there's my endpoint for 3.100, but there's no entry yet for the 192.168.1.10. Now we're going to change that and we'll see what happens. Before we get to actually applying the contract, let's have a quick look at what the spine sees. There are three useful commands that you should remember when you're doing multi-site. And the first one here is called show DCI manager repo VNID maps. What this is doing, this is a view of what the spine is translating in terms of unique values that exist individually in each of the sites. But those values need to be sort of understood from the perspective of all sites. And so the spine will do some translation. So this first command will actually show me all of the VRFs uh, that it understands and what it's translating that VRF to in the remote site. The second command that's useful to know is show DCI manager repo S class maps. Now S class maps is just another fancy way of saying EPG numbering. And we can see right here, we don't have a lot going on, but once we apply the contract, that will change. So we can see here, we have a VRF that ends in 976 locally. Well, that's actually my VRF in tenant brown. So what are these PC tags? Well, these happen to be the stretched EPGs and how they're known locally in this case, site two. And what site two sees it or knows it as in site number one, it knows it by this number. The final useful command to know from the spines is show DCI manager repo ETEPS. This is just a way of seeing how does this spine reach any other sites? Well, we remember that it has to go to the ETEP of the spines in the remote sites. And so we can actually see here, we're looking at it from the perspective of, of the spines in site number two, but site number two says, I know how to reach certain addresses in site number one by these values. So we can see here 11.11.11.20. That's the unicast TEP overlay address uh, that represents site number one. And if we see down here, 11.11.11.25 is actually the multicast special TEP that we use for head end replication. So it's good to remember those three commands. What we'll do next is we'll actually apply the contract between my endpoint in Amsterdam and my endpoint in Barcelona, and we'll see how these tables change.
Here we are back in MSO with our schema brownfield. Let's go ahead and apply the contracts. So here I am under the template level under Amsterdam. And what I'm going to do is take the EPG called AMS-Clients, and I'm going to make that a consumer of services. So I need to apply a contract here. Now I've already got a contract in place. We created that in prior videos, so I don't need to repeat that. I just need to apply the contract. So in this case, I'm going to choose C2. And I'm going to make this particular association as a consumer to that contract and click Save. Now, what's the other end of the contract here? Well, in the site Barcelona, I have a different EPG called BCN-Servers. And so what I'm going to do is make this EPG the provider of that contract. So same contract, C2. And in this case, I will make it the provider and I'll click Save. And then once I click Deploy to Sites, a number of things are going to happen. The first is the contract will get programmed, but what will happen is that will kick off a control plane messaging exchange between the spines in site one and the spines in site two that will ultimately tell each other about reachability for the endpoints that live uniquely in each of those sites. Let's have a look at what that looks like in operation. Well, let's start out by looking at the Coop database in the spines in both of the sites. So here we are back in the spine in site number one uh, in the same location under the endpoint database. Now, when we have a look, we can see, well, there's my local entry of 1.10. You know, he lives in my local site. But aha, there is the entry for the endpoint that actually lives in site number two. What's happened? Well, control plane messages, MPBGP messages have been exchanged between spines to let each other know about reachability. And all of that was kicked off the moment that I applied the contract. And just very quickly looking from the same point of view of the Coop database in the spines in site number two, we can see here's our local entry for 3.100 and there's our remote entry for 1.10. So far, everything is looking good. Now let's switch our view and go over to the tenant Brown. So we're back in site number one. And if we look at the configuration of tenant Brown, a number of things have appeared and these things might be confusing so it's really important that you understand what's going on. So we know that these two EPGs uh, exist locally in Amsterdam. They've always been here. In fact, we can see the message at the top that says this has been created from multi-site, etc, etc. But something showed up that wasn't there before from the perspective of Amsterdam. The application profile and the EPG called BCN-Servers is suddenly now showing up in the Amsterdam APIC. And you might be scratching your head thinking, well, what, what's going on? This is what we call a shadow object. Well, how can you tell other than knowing that if you actually click on the object and you read the message up at the top, it says this is a shadow object pushed by MSC to support intersite policies. Do not make any changes or, or delete this object. Max mentioned in his lecture that we need these shadow objects because each of the local Apex needs to be able to understand and apply policy as it relates to communication between EPGs in one site and EPGs in another. And so we create these shadow objects to complete the equation. If we take a view from the APIC managing site number two in Barcelona, we can see so, sort of the same thing in reverse. We can see that uh, BCN clients and servers have always been there, they're local, but something new was added. There was an EPG called AMS-Clients uh, that is now a shadow object that lives in Barcelona. And again, we only are going to see the EPGs that live in other sites as shadow objects when we have that contract relationship. Notice that AMS servers doesn't exist in Barcelona because we've never done anything with it. There's no contract deployed. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. Let's quickly go back to our spines and check our DCI manager tables and see how they've changed. So you can see at the bottom here, I've issued the command show DCI manager repo S class maps. Now you can see up above, we only had those uh, earlier ones from EPG stretch, but a, a couple of new ones have actually been added down here at the bottom. Uh, let's, let's sort of try to understand what's going on here. What is the spine actually translating? So we have this, this PC tag or this S class or this number that represents an EPG locally, in this case from the spine in site two, and it's 32775. Well, where would we sort of find out what that is? So let's have a look at APIC and I'll show you where, where you find that. So here I am in the APIC managing site two, but I'm looking at the shadow object for the EPG called AMS clients. And locally, according to the APIC in site number two, 
it knows that this has a local class ID of 32775. That's the number we saw in the table. But there's a different number in the table, So, because if we go look at the same EPG from the point of view of Amsterdam, it's going to be a different number. So here we are in the view of Amsterdam, and here's the same EPG, AMS-Client, but it has a different class ID from the perspective of Amsterdam of 16386. If we go back to our translation table in the spine, now again, this is the spine inside too, we can see that it knows a local EPG by the number 32775, but it knows that in the remote side, that same EPG is identified as 16386. Now don't get too caught up in the translations, but just know that the spine is handling all of this translation for you, all of this mapping, all of this work. You don't have to worry about it, but it is definitely useful to know that it is going on in the background. Now just to complete the picture in your mind to prove connectivity, here we have the console of the EP in site number one that lives at 192.168.1.10. And here on the right, we have our endpoint living in site 2 at address 192.168.3.100. Now, the real test is, can EP3 ping EP4? And in fact, we know that it can because we checked our control plane, we know our contract is in place, and we can prove this by showing the ping actually crossing. Now, the next question is, can this person ping anything that's in the stretch EPG? Well, we know it's not going to work because we don't actually have the contract applied uh, to the stretch EPG. So let's do that next. I will add EPG stretch to use the same contract. So at this point in time, EP1 through EP4, all of them will all be able to talk uh, by the existence of this contract. Then what I'll do is instigate a live migration where I will move EP1 from site number one over to Barcelona site number two, and I'll keep a constant ping going so that we will see that during a live migration, we do not lose connectivity and that this is fully possible in a multi-site environment. So you should know by now how to apply contracts, but just to show you, I've already done this is in the common items, EPG stretch. I've applied contract C2 in this case as a provider. And I also want to take a quick look at the bridge domain that we're calling BD stretch because I have some specific settings. I just want to point out here that for BD stretched, I have enabled the L2 stretch box, which means that this BD, of course, will be stretched. But I disabled the checkbox called intersite bump traffic allowed. Now that's the use case where we want to stretch a BD, stretch a subnet, but we don't want to send flooded traffic. So that's the broadcast, unknown, unicast, and multicast traffic for this particular bridge domain. Now let's do the test. I'm going to actually run a constant ping from 1.10 towards 4.10. So this is now the EPG living in site 1, Amsterdam clients actually pinging EPG stretch. So I'm going to keep this ping going and I'll get to that in just a minute. And then from the other side, I'm going to ping 1.10. So they're, they're basically pinging each other. Why am I doing a constant ping? Because I actually want to show you that a live migration actually works in this particular case in multi-site. So switching over to the view of my vCenter here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off what's called a vMotion of this particular host. Now this particular host, Ubuntu Stretch S1-10a, he's currently living in Amsterdam site number one. And what I want to do is I want to migrate him over to a host that's living in site number two. So let's go through the steps. I'm going to pick the host that lives in site 2. So this is a VM living on port group on a DVS that lives solely in site number 1, moving it to another ESX host in site number 2 on an entirely different DVS. But remember, this is a stretched EPG, so that EPG equally already lives in both DVSs. And we can see that here. We can say source network and destination network are the exact same port group, and that's what we want to see. We'll click Next. We'll make it high priority, and then we'll review and click Finish, and we'll see at the bottom that this is kicking off. Let's actually go and take a look at our pings and see that we don't lose a single ping. So here we are back at our endpoints, and we can see that they're each pinging each other, and things are going just fine as the vMotion uh, completes. And it looks like we may have lost one ping uh, on the Windows side as, as probably things uh, uh, settled down, but that's no big deal. Okay, now let's go on to my last example. I'm going to finish off with two additional security features that we've added into MSO very recently. The first one is called Preferred Group. 
And a preferred group is simply saying that even in the absence of a contract, in this case I have no contract, uh, simply by being a member of what we call a preferred group, this will allow free communications between any EPGs that are a part of that group. I've already fully removed any contracts that I had previously deployed. Nobody in any part of my multi-site environment can talk at this moment in time. But what I want to do is in Amsterdam, I want AMS clients and in Barcelona, the EPG called BCN servers to be in what's called a preferred group so that they can actually talk and they won't actually need a contract. So how do I go about doing that? Well, in MSO, it's actually quite easy. So I'll start with BCN servers because I'm in here now. At the very bottom of the right configuration column, there's a box here that says include in a preferred group. I'll click that box and I'll click save. Notice a little icon of sort of four little squares, like a little present has appeared over the EPG. That's an indication that preferred group is actually enabled. And I'll go ahead and deploy that while I'm here. We'll do the same thing from the point of view of, of Amsterdam. Now there's AMS clients EPG. I want this guy also to be a member of the preferred group. Same thing, click the box and deploy to sites. I have a ping going from the endpoint in Amsterdam, pinging the endpoint in Barcelona. And here we can see the endpoint, which wasn't pinging before we joined them to the preferred group. But after we deployed and preferred group is in action, we can see that pings begin. Let's have a look in multi-site. So the EPG called AMS clients, which doesn't have a contract, can talk to the EPG called BCN servers, which doesn't have a contract, but they're both in the preferred group. Okay, very last thing, let's talk about VZNE. Now VZNE, in a very simple explanation, is a concept that allows me to apply contracts not at the EPG level, but apply those contracts at the VRF level, and the result is any EPGs that are associated to bridge domains that are using this VRF will automatically inherit any contracts that are deployed under VZNE. It's a more efficient way in certain designs to apply common contracts across a lot of EPGs in one fell swoop. What I've already done was I disabled the preferred group because you can only have one of those on at a time, either preferred group or VZNE. Maybe somewhere down the road will allow you to have both at the same time, but for right now, it's one or the other. Here I am back in my template called Common Items where my VRF lives equally across both sites. I've clicked on to the VRF called V2 for my tenant Brown, and then in the configuration panel on the right, you see I have an option called VZNE. Well, let's go ahead and click it. Unlike preferred group, you can't just click it and be done. You actually have to tell it, now, which contracts would you like it to use? So I'm gonna very quickly uh, take my contract C2, and I'm gonna make it both consumer and provider at the VRF level, and we'll click save, and it's just that easy. At this point in time, nobody is able to talk. Let's go and check on our endpoints real quick. We can see here that we're trying to ping 3.100 and it's not working. Now let's deploy to sites and let's go check on our endpoints once again. And we can see without having done anything other than apply those contracts that the pings are working. So now what that means, this is sort of an example of any to any. At this point in time, because all of my EPGs, my Stretch EPG, my Amsterdam EPG, my Barcelona EPG, they're all using VRF V2, who now has this VZ any level contract. At this point, everybody can talk to everybody in an any to any kind of scenario. Now you can get clever and you can configure that any way you want, but this is maybe the simplest example of VZ any in multi-site. And that concludes everything I wanted to show you in this particular video. Thank you very much for watching, upward and onward.